All right. Hello, everyone. I think we're going to get started. So welcome to the last Paul Torrens Health Forum at UCLA this year. We'll, of course, be continuing the, ne them next year. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We have a great panel of um, experts on today's topic. Um, I also wanted to thank, of course, um, you know, the, the funders and the supporters of the Paul Torrens uh, Health Forum at UCLA. As many of you know, we've been doing these for several years um, as the School of Public Health Forum. And recently, there was a, a groundswell of support to name this after one of our really esteemed faculty members, Paul Torrens, who's here today in the audience. Um, and earlier, we were talking a little bit about in the lobby about Paul being everyone's mentor and the fact that most people in the room probably can point to Paul to Dr. Torrens as uh, one of their mentors in their career. And as a uh, junior faculty member here at UCLA for several years, um, I can tell you that he was one of those mentors for me as well. And I think the, the really key thing about Paul is that um, it never feels like he doesn't have time for you and he provides this personal attention that makes it feel like you're the only one who matters. And I think that's really important for our students and our faculty. Um, and he's been a great help to UCLA, but also to a lot of our alumni who have been really um, helpful in moving our healthcare system forward. So I did want to thank Paul for all of his work. And, um, and helping the, the health forum get started. So as many of you know, this is a free event that UCLA has been putting on for several years. Every month we have a new topic. We try to keep it as timely as possible. And so um, this month we're talking a bit about uh, post-ACA, post-Affordable Care Act, um, how things are working in terms of innovation and technology and being able to embrace innovation and technology. The argument being, you know, a lot more people have health insurance access in the state of California and in the U.S. overall, partially because of the Affordable Care Act's expansion of Medicaid and the expansion of uh, insurance exchanges, but also the use of the employer mandate to uh, create some sort of baseline employer-based coverage. I think one of the struggles we end up with is if it's creating access through insurance, um, you have these issues around navigating the system and benefits and coverage decisions that might help or hamper uh, the actual adoption of technology or the ability to really integrate care with uh, innovation. And payment reform and reimbursement may not necessarily align with those innovations and, uh, and technology. So we're really today, here today to talk about how that interface takes place and how that interaction really works. Um, so just to remind everyone, the Affordable Care Act's expansion of insurance coverage um, really occurred in January 1st, 2014 for most states. Of course, in California, the governor and the legislature embraced the Medicaid expansion as well as um, the creation of a state-based health insurance exchange. Uh, but throughout the country, we've seen uh, you know, only about 19 states are left without Medicaid expansions, and every state has a health insurance exchange either run through the state government or through healthcare.gov. So the uninsurance rate has basically been cut in half at this point. I think a recent uh, National Health Interview survey uh, analysis by the CDC said that the California uninsurance rate is now lower than the national average. So nationally, it's, I think, about 9.1%. In California, it's 8.1% uninsured. So basically 92% of the population is insured. And you see the sources of coverage and the share of coverage changing quite a bit because of the ACA at the same time that this expansion of coverage is occurring. So there's been a slight increase in employer-based coverage to about 56% of the population. Medi-Cal enrollment has increased to about 26.6%. And then we have the individual market going from about 9% of the insurance share to about 14% by 2014. So the types of coverage are certainly changing that people are in. And so you see some of these gaps that may have occurred pre-2014 being filled in. Um, however, that insurance coverage has very distinct benefits, partially uh, determined by the essential health benefits package that would be adopted by each state. So the federal government doesn't say what the essential health benefits package should be exactly. They basically say there's guidance that seven different options will be acceptable as an essential health benefits benchmark, but those benefits and coverage limitations could be different depending on the state you're in. Um, so California has a fairly generous benefit package broadly, 
but it doesn't necessarily look like look the same across all the different markets. So the essential health benefits package may be um, available in the individual and small group market, both inside and outside of the health insurance exchanges. But the benefit package is different in Medicaid, it's different in Medicare, and it's different in employer-based insurance depending on who your employer is. So there's quite a bit of confusion about what benefits are covered and not a lot of guidance about the details of those benefits uh, in federal law and in the ACA itself. So today's discussion will talk about opportunities and barriers in that post-ACA world for technology, innovation, and as well as population health, um, thinking about how that impacts health status over time, but also how we operate in our healthcare system. We also want to consider if new and improved insurance coverage comes with improved access to technology and innovative care models and what the barriers are and constraints that might uh, constrain or help the ability of providers and insurers and other uh, care delivery systems to improve population health, to improve care delivery, and embrace technology if it's viewed as effective and helpful. Um, so we have a fantastic set of panelists today. Um, you'll notice that I have seven different things that they're all expert in, and so um, there are only three people with all of this expertise. So I think it's great to have them here. Um, they offer unique perspectives as well. And so, you know, if you think about each one comes from a different perspective in terms of overseeing insurance benefits and um, working at higher levels in policymaking. Um, you have someone who's on the delivery system side at UCLA. You also have someone who's on the more innovative and technological side looking at population health and self-management from a patient perspective. So I think we have a broad array of expertise today on our panel, and it'll be really helpful in thinking through all of these issues around technology and innovation, but also these issues around reimbursement and coverage limitations and insurance benefits themselves. Uh, so I'll introduce them in order. We'll then come back and they'll come to the, each one will come to the podium at uh, separate times. Um, and then we'll be holding questions until the end of uh, the session when they'll all come up on the panel and we'll uh, engage in a little bit of question and answer. So our first speaker will be John Lewis. He uh, has a master's in health policy from NYU. He's the associate director of the California Health Benefit Review Program. So affectionately, those of us who work with uh, this organization call it CHIPRP, which is an excellent acronym. Um, and in essence, they act as the uh, scorer on cost, medical effectiveness, and public health for any state legislative benefit mandate that comes through the legislature. So the um, what is covered and what is not is often something that uh, John deals with on a daily basis. And each legislative session, he's dealing with between eight and 19 bills coming through and uh, helping a team from the University of California universities to uh, score those bills and figure out what the impact would be on a cost, medical effectiveness, and public health uh, um, experience. And next we'll have uh, Dr. Mike Ong, who's here at UCLA in the David Geffen School of Medicine. He's an associate professor in general internal medicine and health services research. Um, and he's done quite a bit of work um, in health services and training physicians who uh, work in health services research and also work in translational science. Um, and he has a leadership role in the Clinical and Translational Science Institute, and he'll be sharing today some of his work on innovation and changes to delivery system, and probably share with us a little bit about what the struggles, but also the improvements that have occurred since the ACA have been. Um, and lastly, we'll have Dr. Neil Kaufman, who is the Chief Medical Officer and Founder of Canary Health, uh, formerly DPS Health. He was, for I think 27 years or 30 years, a professor of pediatrics and public health here at UCLA in the David Geffen School of Medicine. He was one of the co-founders of the UCLA Center for Healthier Children, Families, and Communities, and has had leadership roles at UCLA, at First Five LA as a commissioner, and also at Cedar sinai over the years. And his focus has been on um, technology and making uh, use of patient self-management tools to manage chronic disease, more with a focus on wellness and improving health status over the more kind of reactive disease management we typically see run by uh, different third party vendors. So I'll have all three of these uh, great panelists um, coming up to the stage at each time. So 
Next, I wanted to introduce uh, John Lewis, who we already heard from, and then, as I mentioned, we'll be holding questions, um, and I'll come back up and reintroduce each uh, panelist, and then we'll uh, reconvene as a panel together, and then we'll open up the discussion. So let's welcome John. <laughs> 